If you're happy and you know it, can you jam your hands together for Jesus? Woo! Right where you're seated, can you do me a favor? Just join your hands to the person on your left and on your right. The spirit of intercession is here this morning. Just hold hands, make sure nobody is left untouched. God is here, Jesus is here, the Holy Ghost is here. We're releasing into every hand as you gently squeeze those hands. I want you to squeeze those hands gently and we squeeze into those hands power. We squeeze into those hands authority. We squeeze into those hands breakthroughs. We declare that the worst of days are over and behind you. And you're entering into a season of the fulfillment of God's blessings. And so, Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask that the Spirit of a living God will flow through this place this morning. That the word of the Lord flows unhindered, unchecked by any outside force. I declare in the name of Jesus over my brothers and my sisters here that you will fight their battles. They will hold their peace. And this year will end with shouts of joy. If you believe it, lose those hands, put them up together, and jam them for Jesus! My name is Sheikh Mwake and I am privileged to serve in this church as one of the pastors here. On today specifically, I have the privilege of leading us further in today's service. But before I move on, I would like to pause for the cause of acknowledging our, our lead pastor and co-lead pastor, Pastor Femi and Ake Omotayo, who provide us with courageous leadership. Leadership that doesn't know the answer to every question, but leadership that's humble enough to admit what they know and what they do not know. My friends, it's a privilege to have such people leading us. And so if you're happy with me, can you put your hands together and appreciate God for the gift of Pastor AK and for the gift of Uncle Pastor PF. All right, okay. I feel like I have a word in my spirit. No, I know that I have a word in my spirit on this Sunday morning. I would invite your intelligent attention to the Word of God documented in 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse 41. I will invite your intelligent attention there. And I will be in the message translation of the Word of God on this Sunday morning. If you have a Bible, it's wonderful. If you have it on your phone, it's glorious. But if you don't, we have a screen, and we're all going to read from the screen. First uh, Kings chapter 18, verse 41. Here we go. Elijah said to Ahab, Up on your feet. Eat and drink. Celebrate. Rain is on the way. I hear it coming. Well, y'all know when it's nice, you read it twice. Elijah said to Ahab, up on your feet, eat and drink, celebrate. Rain is on the way, I hear it coming. And so I like to target text, I like to target title on today's text and teach with the topic. If you don't mind, help me just slap your neighbor half half and say, neighbor. Neighbor. Oh, neighbor. Rain is coming. coming. Can you help me? I found the other neighbor, the other one on the other side and say, neighbor. Neighbor. Oh, neighbor. Rain is coming. Well, can you throw your hands up to God by yourself and declare to yourself, say, Shags, rain is coming. The devil is a liar. Father, we thank you. For the anointing that makes it easy to speak your word. We declare that your name be glorified. The devil will be horrified. And your people will be edified. It is in the name of Jesus the Christ we pray. Somebody shout amen. Amen. Mm. My friends. When God gets ready to cut a deal with you. God does not need any collateral. 
God is big and bad by himself. When he says something, he backs it up. Matter of fact, Isaiah 55 and 11 puts it this way. He says, so shall the word be that goes out of my mouth. Shandabaya. It will not return to me void. It will uh, prosper. It will accomplish that which I please and prosper in the things whereunto I sent it. And the simple reason for this is because God is a covenant God. So when God speaks, God speaks in covenant terms. And where covenant is involved, blood is involved. Uh, the Bible tells us this uh, in Leviticus. It says the life of the flesh is in the blood. And where blood is involved, it cannot be reversed. Which means where there is covenant, it's not possible to lie. This is why the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 18, by two immutable things, it's impossible for God to lie. When God speaks, God is big enough to bring his words to fruition. And so my friends, uh, it becomes interesting as we begin to extract the concept of covenant because I just said now that God speaks in covenant terms. No better place to understand this than the life of Abraham. Abraham, we're told, was a friend of God, the father of faith, the father of many nations. And the Bible says God got ready to cut covenant with, uh, with Abraham. And by the time we get to somewhere about Genesis chapter 15, uh, this is one of the things that we find out. God says to Abraham, Abe, uh, on the account of my covenant with you, your descendants will be strangers and sojourners in a strange land for 400 years. But at the end of 400 years, I will visit them and I will punish the nation that has held them captive. And so Abraham goes on his way and goes by the way of all aged, and the Bible says that God was faithful to his promise. 430 years passed, and the children of Israel, God miraculously brought them out of bondage and captivity in the land of Egypt, and God led them out. By the time you get to Deuteronomy, I think, uh, chapter 5, uh, the Bible begins to tell us around about verse 14 and 15. It tells us how God brought them out of captivity. He says he brought them out with a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm, meaning that God did not just bring them out like that, it involved a lengthy process. It means that what happened to them did not just happen haphazardly. God was deliberate and intentional with a mighty and outstretched arm. And so God brought the children of Israel out of Egypt. And, and the Bible begins to let us know that God led them through. And uh, uh, we begin to see the children of Israel as God brought them through. It took God ten plagues to bring the children of Israel out of captivity. The Bible tells us that when they got out of captivity, God parted the Red Sea and they walked on dry ground. It was mighty. The Bible tells us that they looked behind their shoulder. Pharaoh and his chariots were drowned because God brought them out by an outstretched arm. Don't you see the extent to which God is going to go to protect the ones that he loves? And so the Bible tells us that they were going through in the wilderness. Picture this, my friends. Their clothes did not uh, run out on them. Uh, I was wondering, you know, Pastor Wiki, I'm thinking for, for, for years, for 40 years, the, the Bible didn't tell us that they took a shower, but we didn't the Bible didn't record that the place was stinking. Because only God can bring you through with a mighty and outstretched arm. The Bible tells us that they didn't need to change their raiment, they didn't need to change their shoes. Pastor Somi, you know, I'm sure your parents did it. You know, my parents, when I was growing up, they would buy me shoes. And they would expect me to grow into... But God did not give them those kind of shoes. It was the kind of shoes that as they were growing, the shoes were growing on demand. Can I just declare to somebody, God is about to bless you on demand. As you continue to move, the blessings will overtake you. Shout amen. And so the Bible tells us that God brings them out and, and, and he does all of this. But it bothers me because all through scriptures, especially in the Old Testament, God will have to specifically tell the children of Israel to remember. If I do anything good for you, please better remember. Come on now. God with a mighty outstretched arm delivered these people. But God has to tell them from time and time again to remember. But not, but, 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 you see, the challenge for me is this. Woven into the fabric of our existence as human beings is God's concept of memory. And memory is God's system whereby we can hear, we can see or think of something in the past in a way that impacts and affects us in the present.
So every one of us has been hard-coded by God with a system of memory. Matter of fact, some psychologists tell us that we don't remember things by days, we remember in moments. And so if God brought you out with a mighty outstretched arm, I'm wondering why you need to be told to remember. But I also realize, my friends, that what is a vivid memory for us today may fade and wane over time to where we no longer remember. But here it is for me, my friends. There are some things I see that I cannot unsee. There are some things that I have known or I now know. And Bookie, I cannot unknow them. And so is the power of our memory. But the children of Israel gradually began to forget about God. And so God brought them through. And it got to a time God wanted to be their God. But they had a different agenda. They started telling God that they wanted a king. Meanwhile, God's intent for them was not to be led by a king, was to be led by God himself. And the Bible says that as they were looking at other surrounding nations, they wanted the things that the other nations wanted. My friends, we must realize not every practice that works on the other side of the fence is applicable with the destiny that God has for your life. That when God has his hands on your life, you cannot copy and paste everything. There are some downloads that are not compatible with your operating system. Because God wants to be your God. The children of Israel now are getting to a place where they're gradually forgetting God. And the interesting thing with the devil is that he doesn't let you forget God all at once. It happens slowly, but surely. So my friends, the children of Israel, now God has decided to give them a king. And the Bible says, they have a king. The first king is Saul. A little bit of Bible class. The second king is David. The third king is Solomon. And by the end of Solomon's reign, the kingdom is divided into two unequal parts. Again, a little bit of Bible class because we want to be intelligent students of the word of God. So the kingdom is divided into two unequal halves. Ten tribes make up the northern protectorate called Israel. And two tribes make up the southern protectorate called Judah. So ten tribes make Israel on the north. Two tribes make Judah on the south. And the kingdom of Israel is constantly on a decline until they get to the seventh king of the tribe of Israel whose name is Ahab. But keep in mind in Deuteronomy chapter 6, round about verse 14, God instructed them not to have anything to do with the gods of their surrounding nations. God gave them prior notification and prior warning. So you must not worship the God of the neighboring nations. But they did not listen and they were on a decline. And by the time we now have King Ahab, King Ahab has taken idolatry to disastrous levels. And it doesn't end there, Pastor Sami. King Ahab hooks up with a sister whose name is Jezebel. Jezebel imports the gods of our fathers and brings them to Ahab in the land of Israel. My friends, if you're single, I'm not a marriage expert, but please be careful who you hook up with because if the sister don't know Jesus, if the brother don't know Jesus, Ahab is your sample. And by the way, we have a very robust premarital system in this church. So if you want to get married, before the hookup, contact Pastor Eke. Moving on. So he hooks up with this sister, and this sister messes, it up, messes him up real good, and now idolatry has gone to the next dimension. But you see, the Bible already says in Isaiah 
uh, I think it's right about verse, chapter 42. He says, I am the Lord. That is my name. I will not share my glory with another. So God will never sit and watch his glory to be shared with the God of Jezebel. So God says, Jezebel, the battle line has been drawn. And you know, oftentimes when God gets ready to go to battle, God always has a vessel he has prepared on the backside of the desert. See, this is why you must not despise the periods where you are not known or obvious. Because God is preparing you for a specific purpose. And so my friends, the Bible tells us that God has his man. His name is Elijah. And so I began to read about Elijah. And I tried to do my due diligence, but I didn't find anything about his lineage or ancestry or parents or anything like that. We just know that Elijah shows up. But I have enough sense to know that what we see as Elijah showing up was the private presentation. But before the private presentation, the devil is alive. See, so I have to go back to this thing. I blame it on Pastor Sommer, but I'm on preach this thing. And so the Bible tells us now that, that, that we, now, uh, we now find ourselves where uh, Elijah is, been going, is going to be used by God. Elijah is going to be God's man for God's assignment. My friends, I need to quickly pause and take a few lessons from Elijah. Because before God will use you significantly publicly, he cultivates a personal practice privately. And so, my friends, we must never joke with the private practices and relationship that we build with God because it is on those accounts that God deploys us publicly. And my friends, you must understand this. Timing is everything to God. God may prepare you for 20 or 30 years, whatever the time frame, for a specific assignment that he has for you. Pastor Wiki, I found out that God is not in a hurry. And that messes my mind a lot of times because I want God to do it like yesterday. But when God is taking you somewhere, he takes his time to prepare you for where he's going to deploy you. And so God prepares Elijah for years and years for an assignment in the presence of Ahab. And I've also come to realize, my friends, that God doesn't really pay attention to my emotional disposition about how I feel about what he is taking me through. Until the process is complete, I can cry black and blue. It does not really change God. Oh, and can I also say, overthinking does not solve problems. So we now get to a place where God has processed and prepared Elijah. And by the time we're going to see Elijah, Elijah shows up in the presence of Ahab in 1 Kings chapter 17. And Elijah clears his throat and says something like this. He's saying that there will be no rain. If y'all want to help us, let's have the scripture so that these people know that I'm not just uh, fabricating it. In chapter 17, he's saying that there will be, there will be a drought. There will be no rain only according to my word. See, it takes somebody who has built spiritual equity with God to be able to appear before the king making such bodacious statements. Elijah had built relationship and equity in the spirit and he could appear before Ahab. You know, to appear before the king in those days was not for the weak-willed or the lily-livered. It was not just for anybody. Now on top of that, the brother has hooked up with the sister named Jezebel who was a fierce and ferocious lady who was a terror in the nation. So by that declaration, Elijah made himself an endangered species and he made himself an enemy of the state. He declared a drought and my friends, Israel is an agrarian economy which flourished based on agriculture and farming. 
So for you to declare a drought means that the whole nation was in trouble. But you see, my friends, the nation was in trouble because of failure of leadership. Because John Maxwell says to us, everything rises and falls on leadership. Now, Elijah has declared a drought. And here is the challenge. He's not just declaring a drought that he is not going to be a part of. And I'm wondering, if God is going to use me, why doesn't God just make sure that I'm no longer in that, na in that city or something like that? But God put Elijah there to show that you can be in the world, but not of the world. That you can be in an economy and function outside of the economy. And God will miraculously provide for Elijah. Time will fail me to go into all of those. And the Bible tells us, Elijah declares this drought, and for three years there would be no rain. But interestingly, Baal, the God who they've been serving, the idol, was regarded as a God of rain. But you see, when the battle line is drawn between God and other gods, there can only be one winner. There can only be one outcome. So for three years, Baal lost his ability to produce rain. And this is where we find Elijah. Elijah now has to find a way to live for the next three years without the rain. And so, by the time we begin to get into somewhere around about 1 Kings chapter 18, I, I actually need us to read this one. So, Avi, please help me. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 1, the message translation. And you know, you cannot, you cannot really cram the message translation. So, help me. Let's look at what it says. It says, a long time passed. Then God's word came to Elijah. The drought was now in its third year. Listen to the message. Go and present yourself to Ahab. I'm about to make it. I thought it was only in the strip club that they make it rain. <laughs> but God was the original one who made it rain. And God says... I'm about, somebody just slap your neighbor and say, God's about to make it rain. Yeah, yeah. And so the Bible says, through the mouth of Elijah, I didn't say it, it's in the Bible. I'm about to make it And so, listen to the instruction. What did God say? He says, go and present yourself to Ahab simple instruction he didn't say particularly to tell Ahab it was about to rain it says present yourself on the account of your presentation this is what I'm going to do so Elijah has to obey God to the letters my friends nothing brings God joy as much as our obedience to him Elijah has to show dependence on God that what God says, God will bring to pass. And the Bible tells us now that because Elijah is an endangered species, and I know this because round about verse, uh, verse 10, 1 Kings chapter 18, when Elijah shows up, they said to him, the king has been looking for you everywhere. And anytime he doesn't find you, he will cut a deal with the people just to be sure they're not hiding you. So Elijah was endangered. But Elijah kept trusting God. My friends, can you trust God even when it's not convenient for you? Because my friend, the hallmark of our faith experience is that we are able to depend on God, a declaration of dependence on God. Because my friend, it is in our depending on God that we get to grow in faith. And the, 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 the evidence of our growth is that we build confidence in God. My friends, we must learn to take God by his word and believe his word because God is dependable. So Elijah depends on God. Elijah depends on God's word. And uh, he goes before Ahab. But it's interesting because at the end of the day, when he gets to Ahab, this is what we find. Ahab looks at him and says, oh, you're the one that's been troubling the nation. You know, isn't it funny how people always like to refuse to take responsibility for their actions? 
Uncle Ahab, you're the one who been. Uh, yeah, what I want to say is not appropriate for the church. But you've been hooking up with this sister. And you've brought trouble on the nation. And you dare to accuse me as being a troublemaker. Let me say this. We're born looking like our parents. But we die looking like the decisions that we make. I'll say that one more time. We're born looking like our parents, but we die looking like the decisions that we make. Ahab, you've put the country in trouble. There's a drought and it's not ending for three years. The economy is in a downward trend. Nothing seems to be working. And here comes Elijah. But you see, my friends, I also learned from this story that whenever God makes a promise to you, there is the divine part and there is the human part. It's a combination of the super and the natural that produces what we call supernatural. Elijah has to go to battle on the account of what God has said to him. Because for every promise, there is a fight. Uh, I know this to be a fact because somewhere in 1 Timothy, I think chapter 4, Paul begins to speak to Timothy. He says, concerning the prophecies that have been made over your life, you need to learn how to fight or war a good warfare. And so the stage is set. Here is Elijah, 450 prophets of Baal. And Elijah says, you know what? If God is God, choose him this day. Otherwise, let's settle this context once and for all. You pick your own animal. I'll pick my own animal. And we go on the mountain. And we're going to call on our God. And whichever God answers by fire... He will be the true God. I don't need to bore you with all the details, but by the time we get to somewhere around about verse 28 in 1 Kings chapter 18, uh, the Bible tells us that, you know, the context is set up. Elijah calls on his God, and you know the story, and our own God answers by fire, and he becomes the God that everybody serves. But before then, the Bible tells us that it's interesting. I need to say this, because, you know, one other thing that Baal was known for was he was known as a thunder God, or he was God of lightning. So when they were calling for fire, it should have been an easy thing for him to produce fire. But Baal was nowhere to be found. My friends, anytime you trust in something other than God, it's a recipe for disaster. It may not be disastrous now, but it will be disastrous certainly. Keep that at the back of your pocket. And so we now find ourselves where the stage has now been set, our God has answered by fire. Then the Bible says, by the time we get to my text, that Elijah spoke to Ahab. Please, if we can have the text again, 1 Kings chapter 18, round about verse 41. Uh, okay, they're coming. Well, in 1 Kings chapter 18, in verse 41, what we see there is that God speaking through Elijah says, Elijah says to Ahab, up on your feet, eat and drink, celebrate. Rain is on the way. I hear it coming. My friends, what I learned from this text is this. In the life of faith, sound precedes sight. I say that again. Sound precedes sight. So you may not see it. It does not deny the occurrence of it. This is why Jesus was speaking in Mark 11. He says, what well, things soever you desire, when you pray, believe, you receive. He says, he was telling to the disciples, he said, you will have the things that you say. The reason is because when you say it, you hear it. And when you hear it, it creates a picture and the universe has been programmed in such a way that when you speak it, God backs it up. Especially when you speak according to the word of God, the universe has been structured to obey the word of God. So Elijah is saying, Ahab, it's about to rain. But, but Ahab couldn't see it. But it's interesting that Elijah could hear what Ahab could not see. And so Elijah had to keep telling him what he was eventually going to see. And my friends, I, I don't want to be very long-winded today. I want to respect my time and end my sermon very quickly today. 
what I came to say to you this morning is I came to quickly declare to you a different sound. See, I don't know what sound you've been listening to or you've been hearing all through from January till now, but God sent me here this morning to declare to about a hundred people the rain is coming. It doesn't matter how dry your life has been. God says, I shall announce to you the rain is coming. You know, you know, you know, my friends, my friends, you must understand something about the rain. The first time we're introduced to rain in the Bible is through the man named Noah. The Bible tells us about Noah building an ark. You remember the story if you've been to church. And the Bible says that, that Noah built the ark but the reason why God was sending the rain, Pastor Femi, was because God was getting ready to destroy the earth as it was in existence. But it was not just so much that God wanted to destroy the world, it was that God wanted to restart the world. And so as I was preparing this sermon, the Holy Spirit said, I should tell about a few people that the rain is coming upon your life to indicate a restart season for you. That some things are about to be put away because some new things are about to happen for you. Because my friends, God sent me here this morning to declare that the rain is coming. That whatever has been dead in your life, the rain is about to bring it back to life. See, my friends, one other thing about the rain is that the rain refreshes. The rain brings about germination and restoration. And so I don't know what it is that the devil killed in your life or that you killed by yourself unknown. God says, I shall announce to you, the rain is about to bring it back to life. God says, I shall announce to you that he's about to give you new life. That the devil is a liar. That in the places where you've been defeated, when you get back tomorrow morning, new life, new experience, because the rain is coming. But my friends, if you read that text, if you give us the text again, this is what he says. He says, rain is coming. Rain is on the way. I hear it coming. Oh, but I forgot something. I forgot something. I forgot something. He says, celebrate. He <laughs> says, celebrate. Because my friends, weeping may endure for a night. But joy is coming in the morning. Ah, yeah. I was reading in the Bible. And the word of God declared. Only the sound of joy and gladness is in the camp of the righteous. Can I get some little more volume on this thing? Because I'm about to preach my socks off. And I want to let the devil and his mother-in-law know. That it's about to rain. That whatever the devil has done. The rain is about to fall. Only the sound of joy. Somebody shout joy. Listen, listen, listen. It may not look like it, but God wants me to announce to you that the sound of joy is about to fill your home. Somebody shout celebrate. Listen, my friends, before I take my seat, I found a scripture in Psalm 100 and, uh, I know, about Psalm 50, 52. This is what he says. He says, cause me to hear joy and gladness that the bones that you have broken may dance again. I don't know who the devil has stolen your dance. The devil has taken your joy. But God says I should tell you to practice a little bit. That if you just practice a little bit, he's putting your dance back. God says to tell you to move your body a little bit. Because he's about to make you dance again. God is about to make you rejoice again. God is about to make it right for you. Somebody shout amen. I'm almost through. The other day, my father called me. My father, very theologically sound and astute man. He never speaks to you without biblical reference. But on this day, he calls and he's blessing. He says, I don't know where it is in the Bible, but I have an announcement for you. He says, say to the righteous, 
it shall be well with him i came to share my patriarchal blessing with you this morning he says i should declare to the righteous it shall be well with you can you help me slap three people a high five and tell them it is well with you oh yeah say to the righteous it shall be well with them it shall be well with you you will rejoice you will celebrate because the rain is at the end of the day my friends I don't want to get so fixated on Elijah because Jesus says the law and the prophets they speak of me. So, we've been talking about Elijah and what was Elijah's sacrifice on the altar has now become Jesus our Passover. That I don't have to put sacrifice on the altar anymore, but accept the finished work of Jesus. And the Bible says that he was wounded for my transgressions. He was bruised for my iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, I've been healed. Because Elijah only came to point us to Jesus, the Lamb of God who take it away the sins of the world but this is what Jesus says he says in this world you will have tribulations but be of good cheer because when Elijah says celebrate Jesus came and said be of good cheer and that is why I want you to know that wherever life has you right now you can celebrate because the rain is coming I know the rain is coming because it's been it's it's been sealed by the blood of Jesus. And so, what was a drought as punishment for the children of Israel has become Jesus for us. The Bible says God has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God. That God doesn't have to punish me anymore. That Jesus has paid the price in full. And all I need to do is to believe in Jesus. Because when I believe in him, he's the real rainmaker. And I can walk out of this place declaring the rain is coming. You, you, may, not, you may not feel it, but I can hear it. I can hear it. The rain is coming. Can you help me slap your neighbor high five? Say, neighbor. neighbor. Oh, neighbor. The rain is coming. Can you look for another neighbor on the other side? Slap the neighbor high five the neighbor. Oh neighbor. The rain is coming. Can you throw your hands up to God and declare to yourself, the rain is coming. My name is Shags. And I approve this message. Somebody give God a shout of praise. Praise God like you know the rain is coming. Praise Him like you can hear the sound of the rain. Praise Him like you know the rain is falling on your finances. It's falling on your business. Praise Him like you know that the rain is coming. Every head bowed and every eye closed. The rain will only be of significance if you're in agreement with the real rainmaker. The same rain through which Noah survived destroyed other people. If you don't know Christ, the rain can do you no good. And so if you're here, you've not made Jesus the Lord of your life. I present to you Jesus, the rainmaker. I present to you Jesus, the friend of the wounded heart. 
I present to you Jesus, a friend who sticks closer than a brother. I present to you Jesus, the mediator of a better covenant. And if you want to make Jesus the Lord of your life, very simple. Just say with me, Lord Jesus, with my heart I believe that you are the Christ. With my mouth I confess that you died for my sins. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Come in today. Come in to stay. From this day forward, I am yours only. In Jesus' name. If you said that prayer with faith, there is loud celebration in heaven for the fact that you came back to your father. And so right here on earth, can we join with the angelic host and give God a shout of praise for our brothers and sisters who have come back to the Father.